שבת שלום. שבת שלום. This week, we see the leadership of Moses and Aaron challenged by a group of people who all believe that the children of Israel are holy. So, why should Moses and Aaron lead the people? Moses does not strike back as most of us would. He doesn't try to lift himself up, become puffed up. Instead, he drops to his knees and he places the entire situation in the hands of the creator. 250 contenders for Moses, for, I'm sorry, for Aaron's job are told to bring incense pans to the tent of meeting. Moses tells them tomorrow, Adonai will reveal who is holy. But who exactly is this Korah who sparks the rebellion? There are many fanciful stories about Korah outside of the book of Numbers. In the Talmud, he's regarded as a man motivated by wealth and constantly questioning Moses. In the Quran, Korah is also mentioned as wealthy and arrogant. In the book of Jude, groups Korah's sin with the slanderous people who oppose believers through history. Korah was the great grandson of Levi. He was the first cousin of Aaron and Moses. He was a family member. His family was assigned to the most holy of objects, the very objects which most represent the heavenly sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant, the showbread, the menorah, the altars, the gold and silver implements, the parakat, which is the curtain of the most holy. That's in Numbers 3, 31. Just like a certain archangel who corrupted himself against Adonai, Korah became important in his own eyes, and he led thousands astray from the Creator. Moses said to the leader of the rebellion, Listen now, sons of Levi, isn't it enough that God of Israel has set you apart from the community of Israel to bring you near to him to do the work of the tabernacle of Adonai? and to stand before the community to minister to them. So he brought you close, along with all your fellow sons of Levi. But you are seeking the priesthood too. Therefore you and all your following are banding together against Adonai. Who then is Aaron that you are grumbling against him? Number 16, the next day, Korah and his co-conspirators the 250 contenders who would be high priest and Moses and Aaron stood in front of the tent of meeting. And Adonai appeared before them and said, separate yourselves from among this assembly so that I may consume them at once. But Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and Moses cried out, El Elohim Haruhot, the call basar O God God of the spirits of all flesh if one man sins will you be angry with the entire community number 1622 Moses petitioned for the life of all the innocent men women and children perhaps not just for that community at that time but in some ways perhaps for all the communities even those to today. Adonai Elohim listened to his servant. The earth swallowed up Korah and the rebellious factions. The 250 men with fire pans were consumed completely. Eliezer was given the grim task to pick up the holy vessels from the still burning ashes of men and to scatter the ashes because they had become holy. And the fire pans were hammered into a covering for the altar. But is that the end of the story? Perhaps we in our modern age like nice compact endings. Boy meets girl, Prince marries Cinderella, and they all lived happily ever after. But our father has shown time and again that he is not only the master architect, the unmatched artist, he is also the author of all life. 
He is the master storyteller. You see, there's another ending to the Cora family, one often overlooked when this story is told. In Numbers 26, verse 11, standing in the distance were the sons of Korah, and their tragic, beautiful story was only just beginning. Korah's sons, however, did not die. Numbers 26, verse 11. The rebellion that claimed Korah would reverberate through the centuries, but his descendants, the children of his children's children, would be recited before Adonai forever. I remember years ago, I once stood at the beam at KHD and I said, I, I enjoyed reading all those long genealogies, what the, what the King James Version calls the begats. This person begat that person, this person begat the other. But you know what? They have a purpose. In 1 Chronicles 12, verse 7, we find that Elkanah, the husband of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, was a descendant of Korah. We all know the warrior judge and the prophet who anointed King David, the prophet Samuel, was also a descendant of Korah, a son of Elkanah, a Levi. Some of the most crushing and hopeful songs are written by singers and musicians who served King David. Perhaps you rushed through the first verses of the, many of these psalms, but now, from now on, Pause and reflect when you read them. Because these psalms were not pop hits turned out by producers looking to get rich for the latest hit song. Each psalm was a lived experience connected to life and family history. In some cases, you can hear the despair passed down from father to son to father to son. Songs from the boys who watched their patriarch rebel who was buried alive. Those men made a decision back then as they watched their father disappear into the pit that they would serve the Lord forever. There are blessings in obedience and surrendering to the gentle hand of the creator. He will hide you under the skirt of his robe in times of trouble. Yeshua said no one can snatch someone from the hand of the father. To each of us, he's given his spirit so that we may uplift and serve one another. The same way we use our hands to wash and feed our bodies. So each of us are made stronger when we serve each other. There's a funny word in Hebrew. It's called avodah. It means both prayer and service. And if you dig a little deeper like Paul did, you find it also means serving continuously like a slave, a servant. That word is eved or slave for us in English. That is why he repeatedly calls himself a slave. However, the Greek translators had a problem with Paul calling himself a slave. So they turned the word eved into servant. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, Paulos, Eved Yeshua HaMashiach, Paul, slave of Yeshua HaMashiach. He does it again in Corinthians 9, 19, and in many other places. When Yeshua chose to wash the feet of his disciples, they were, um, to say the least, um, appalled, because that's the work of a servant, an Eved. Peter even said, you shall never wash my feet. But after Yeshua did it, and he sat down, not explaining himself, he said to him, he said to his disciples, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me master and teacher, and rightly you say, for I am. So if I, your master and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example. You should do for each other what I have done for you. Amen, amen, I tell you. A servant isn't greater than his master. Let me repeat that for you. Amen, amen, I tell you. 
a servant isn't greater than his master, and the one who is sent isn't greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You see, there's a blessing in serving one another. That's John 13, verses 12 through 17. In the exact same fashion, the master serves as Kohen Gadol, interceding on our behalf before the throne of grace. It's the exact same fashion that a 100-year-old man, Aaron, put incense in his censer and ran into the vast camp of the Israelites to intercede for a sinful people and stop the plagues. The message, very simple, serve one another continuously, like Eved. Serve Adonai continuously. You never know. The eyes of the children are always watching. And sometimes they're not coming from below. Sometimes children are six feet tall and stand over you. Abedal was something Korah did not understand, but his descendants did. Elkanah, serving in Reuben all those years, did his service every year, returning to the temple. I'm sorry, returning to the to the the uh, tabernacle, faithfully serving every year. And we know the rest of that story. Samuel served faithfully as judge and prophet. So I ask you, are you serving continuously? When the master returns, he will say to all of us, hopefully, well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, verse 21. Or will you be one of those who stand in the crowd and say, I, I, was, I was busy, I was tired. I wanted to, but I never got around to it. There just wasn't enough time. The sons of Korah left powerful messages of hope for all generations. They didn't let that tragic event color their lives forever. Back in the desert, do you think Korah's sons who watched their father descend into the pit believed one day that their descendant would anoint two kings of Israel? You see, the master is the author the final author. He spared the sons of Korah and he turned their grief into joy and gladness. He put in motion Elkanah serving in the cities of Reuben. He turned Hannah's grief into joy when he gave her Samuel. He put in motion the forces that shaped your life too. Be long before your father looked at your mother, he had determined who he would call, that he would call you. He knew exactly who he would choose. Your story, each one of you listening right now, your story is not finished. When you surrender fully to Adonai, your story has only just begun. Just like the fall of Korah and his co-conspirators into the pit and into the fire, the story of their children was only just beginning. He chose our leader these past days, past few days, past few weeks. We all saw it. Even the doctors and the nurses in the place where she was hospitalized believed they had seen a miracle. Hashem, Hashem's reasons were determined long, long ago. Long before that fateful 4th of July, 26 years ago, before our leader bought her first boombox to play worship music, his plans had begun to unfold and his plans are still unfolding today. In Bamidbar, Moses told the people to get away from the rebels, even if he did not know that from Korah would come Samuel the prophet who would anoint King David. Moses certainly could not have known that the words of the sons of Korah would reverberate through all the ages and give comfort to uncounted millions who in times of grief and hardship would turn to their Psalms, even when their hearts are broken, 
even when they don't have the words to say in a prayer. Korah and the rebels paid for their rebellion, but his sons, his descendants, devoted their lives to serving Adonai's community continuously for generations. Servants of Elohim, Ebed, slaves of the master. I leave you with some of the words of the sons of Korah. I am counted with those who go down into the pit. I have become as one with no strength, abandoned among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest places, in dark places, in the depths. Psalm 88. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Psalm 42. For in a day, in your for a day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Psalm 84. Yes, the sons of Korah said that. They would rather be gatekeepers in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. They also said, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of El Yon. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. Adonai Savuot is with us. The God of Jacob is our strong tower. Psalm 46, various verses. You see, your story is not written yet. The story of our leader is not written yet. Stay tuned. The master storyteller is still writing your story. Shabbat Shalom.